Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Rebecca, otherwise known as Hypnit Hooray Online, and this is podcast episode number seven, where I'm going to be sharing one finished object, quite a few whips, and a spring cast on. It's a very bright and sunny day today. I'm trying to time filming the podcast where there aren't going to be really large rays of sun coming into this room, but I can definitely tell that spring is hopefully among us soon because it's getting much brighter, the days are longer, so hopefully I can film this podcast without any of those bright rays that are going to mess up uh, the lighting. So let's jump into finished objects. So, um, the finished object that I'm going to be sharing today is one that uh, I'm sure you've seen before on the podcast, if you've been here before, because I have shared this uh, whip since podcast episode number one. It's now podcast episode number seven, and it is my sweater number 14 v-neck. I think the reason why I kind of just, it took me so long, it's it shouldn't have been this long if I was working on it monogamously. Um, because it's knit on a large gauge. Um, it, it is oversized, but it's knit on a large gauge. Uh, but the reason why is it always just was never the priority. And I always kind of like to have a stockinette project in the background that I can work on. So when other test knits came up that um, were a higher priority gift knits, um, I just didn't end up working on this this sweater. So it kind of got neglected a little bit, but I'm happy that it is done. So um, the sweater number 14 v-neck is a sister pattern to um, the sweater number 14. It just has, as it, the name mentions, a v-neck. It's a top-down drop shoulder sweater that is oversized um, and features a two by two ribbing along the edge and a split hem. So for the yarn that I used, I used, um, this is the leftovers I have here, Lion Brand Wool Ease in the shade Linen, which is a majority acrylic uh, yarn. It's 85% acrylic, 15% wool. And I held it together with uh, Drops Kid Silk in the shade Light Beige. Uh, in terms of project costs, so I used, um, over five skeins, I needed to dip into the six skein of uh, the, the wool ease. So I, I'm gonna say I've used around six balls, uh, even though I have this much left over. And at the time when I purchased it, I looked on Michael's website uh, today and the wool is, wool ease is $7.99, which I didn't purchase it for that much. I would say like two years ago, two and a half years ago, it was definitely less. I don't have the receipt anymore, but I I'm, I think I got it for around $6. So um, $36 for the wool ease. The Drops Kid Silk, I used uh, over just over five balls of yarn. So uh, with both strands held together, just over a thousand meters for the size. Uh, I did a hybrid between a size one and two. So I used five balls of that and I purchased this for $11 a ball. So in total, this project cost me, I wrote it down. $91 in total to knit. So as I mentioned, this is an oversized drop shoulder sweater and I was kind of um, mirroring it off of my October sweater, which is an oversized raglan because I wear my October sweater all the time. I wear it probably multiple times a week because it's something that I just throw on over whatever I'm wearing at home when I'm getting kind of cold. So I wanted another uh, sweater that was going to serve that same purpose, but I wanted it to have a v-neck, so that's why I picked this sweater. But um, I didn't want the drop shoulder to fall too low um, down on my um, arm, because I find that when um, drop shoulders are too oversized, you end up getting a lot of bulk, especially around here or along the back and under the arm. So um, I decided to knit between a size one and two. I mentioned this before in another podcast, but I'll just touch briefly on it because I'm talking about the finished object as a whole. But I cast on the back here before you work the short rows. And then when you pick up the two front panels, I followed the stitch patterns for a size one. But before I um, joined the work in the round, when you were just working a panel of stockinette for the front panel and then the back panel, I also did a series of increases at the edge here. Uh, 
right at the underarm um, of where both sleeves would go. So I worked increases, so I increased by six stitches at the front panel and eight stitches at the back panel. So overall, the circumference of uh, the body of the sweater would be wider and match a size two circumference. In addition to the hybrid of size one and two changes that I made, I also did a few other modifications. Um, I extended the sleeve length by about two centimeters before working the ribbing just because I wanted my sleeves to be extra long and oversized. And as I mentioned before, I also have an issue, I don't know if other knitters, I think maybe other knitters experience this as well, but the more that you wear a sweater, the sleeves kind of tend to shrink a little bit. I think it's because the stitches kind of relax post blocking. There also might be some creases that are worked into the sweater as you wear it a lot. So I just wanted them to be extra long. Uh, and then for the body, I followed the stockinette length before you start working the ribbing, but I just did the ribbing for um, eight centimeters instead of the full four, I think it's 14 centimeters that's recommended in the pattern. So the sweater is a little bit shorter, uh, but that's okay. Um, I still think it ended up being a very oversized sweater on me. So in terms of my final thoughts on uh, this piece, I really enjoy how cozy it is. It's definitely going to be a very um, cozy and comfortable sweater to wear. I've already worn it once around um, my apartment. I think I still do prefer the fit of the October sweater. I just like that gauge combination. It's knit with fingering and mohair on four millimeter needles. So I think I kind of prefer that over, over this. Mind you, I did do a different yarn combination. The pattern uh, recommends three strands of mohair, whereas I did one strand of worsted and one strand of lace, the mohair. So I think I prefer that finished fabric and I just prefer a raglan construction when it's more oversized. Uh, I think it just really depends on your preferences. There's really no, I think like right answer to a drop shoulder or a raglan when things are more oversized. Uh, but just for my preferences, I think I prefer the raglan, but this one is still gonna be a nice closet staple. And the last thing that I wanted to touch on is the yarn. So um, this was my first time using wool ease with mohair and also wool ease for an adult size garment. I used the woolies before to knit a baby sweater in the past. And I do really like the finished fabric. It is uh, very soft and there's a lot more drape, especially after blocking. When I was working this sweater, I was getting a little bit nervous because it seemed very stiff, but it did soften up a lot with blocking and it has a nice drape. Um, I will say though that the wool ease um, doesn't really compare to working with 100% wool, which I think is maybe like quite obvious because it's 85% acrylic, um, so it is majority acrylic. I would say it is better than 100% acrylic. Like you can definitely feel a difference in um, how it feels in the skein. But I would say like, don't get your hopes up that this is going to be a, a great alternative to 100% wool. If you do want to start venturing into more natural fibers, I would say I really recommend the Woolies because it is a pretty affordable price point if um, you have if you have a Michaels close to you and you can grab it. But I definitely think it's worth uh, investing a few more dollars per gain and getting a 100% wool. Um, for example, the Patton's uh, Classic Wool Worsted that's also sold at Michaels is a few more dollars or Knit Picks Wool of the Andes. Um, I would say that those are definitely well worth investing a few more dollars in, but this is still a pretty good alternative. And I do think that holding it with the Drops Kid Silk really elevated the finished fabric. So all in all, really happy to finally have this done after I would say five months of it being a whip. Uh, and I will be adding it into my cozy sweater rotation. And now moving on to whips. My first whip that I'll share today is my wave sweater by Spectacle Streak. Um, the pattern was released in English back in January and I was total, totally influenced by the wave knit along and all the versions I was seeing on Instagram so that's why I cast this on. Um, the yarn that I'm using is, I'm trying to balance them all in my lap here, uh, Lion Brand Fisherman's Wool in the shade Nature's Brown. 
held together with originally lovely fluff in the shade lapis and i'm holding that with knit picks aloft in the shade celestial so this is the main color and then this is the contrast color for the wave and the added mohair just adds a little bit more fluff to that wave which i'm really liking so this is a top down uh raglan construction sweater with an all over color work wave motif um and as i mentioned in my last podcast i i actually don't have that much progress since the last podcast i knit a few more rounds of the color work and raglan and then i also added the collar so um as i mentioned i made a modification straight away at the beginning where i cast on right away with a long tail cast on and then started working the short rows the pattern call uh the pattern says that you should um cast on stitches at the collar and then work the twisted rib collar before working in the body but i was just seeing a lot of versions on instagram with a bit of a wider collar and i really wanted a tighter fitting mock neck and so i thought by casting on the stitches with a long tail cast on i could keep the integrity of the neckline without it stretching out which is why i think the necklines ended up being quite wide on some versions it's i, I don't think it looks bad necessarily uh, i just wanted something that was a tighter fit similar to my port sweater by ozetta and so i thought by doing that long tail cast on i would be able to um, keep the neckline quite tight and then i also did an extra set of short rows because since it was sitting closer i thought maybe i needed more to shape the the back so i did that by modifying the number of stitches and then since then i've picked up uh, stitches basically one in every stitch all the way around and then I did um, seven centimeters of twisted rib or half twisted rib because the inside the purl stitch is not twisted um, which I think is fine because I don't intend this for this to be like folded down like a turtleneck so half twisted rib and I did that for seven centimeters or uh, 14 rounds um, and so far I'm really liking how the collar fits I tried it on but I think it's gonna make a difference the more that I knit the sweater because the weight of the garment is really going to pull on the neckline. And so it's going to sit a little bit differently, I think, but uh, just off of how I tried it on now, I like how it looks. And then I did a few more rounds of um, increases for the wave. You can really see the pattern is starting to take shape and I am having a lot of fun with this. I am a little bit worried because this is my first color work sweater. So I don't really know if my tension is going to be okay if the floats are too tight um but a lot of people left some really encouraging comments in the last episode so i'm kind of just going for it and then once i work the first wave motif i think i'm gonna um put this onto scrap yarn and do a mid project block just so i don't knit the entire sweater and actually my tension was completely off so um i'm approaching that soon but so far the color work is actually a lot more simple than I thought it was going to be. Um, I think that the design is really striking and that's why I maybe thought that it was going to be more complicated than what it is, but you only really have to pay attention to the color work charts uh, for the top of the wave where there's that curve. And then the rest of the wave motif is actually the same um, color work pattern. It doesn't change its, um, I think I can mention it. It's it's four rounds of this main color or four stitches of this main color and then three stitches of the contrast color. And you just repeat that all the way around while working your raglan increases. And so it's actually a lot more simple than I thought. And I think that it's gonna be great practice actually for color work. So besides those longer floats at the very beginning, I think that this is really helping me practice uh, color work and it's actually a lot more beginner Friendly than I thought, at least coming from a beginner myself, <laughs> as a beginner color work knitter. My next whip was one that I also shared in my last podcast episode, and it is my Sunday Socks by Petite Knit. I have them in two different project bags because I've actually knit both the socks, or I'm working on both of the socks. Um, and I did this because I've heard a lot of people always talk about the second sock syndrome and how you just really feel unmotivated to knit the second sock and also I wanted to make sure that I did the heel and the toes in the exact same way so I just wanted to knit both socks so 
here's the first sock that I knit and I basically knit it all the way until I should start working the um, shaping for the toes. So then I stopped here and then that's when I cast on the second sock, which is all tangled right now. But then I cast on the second sock. I just finished working um, the heel and I'm still working on the, the gusset decreases, I think. Um, so yeah, working on that right now. So currently working on the second sock. Then when I catch up to the first sock, I'll do the toes. Um, so far, I think this is a, a really nice pattern. I'm really enjoying it. However, I did have to redo the heel several times. Um, so the Sunday sock is a top-down two by two rib sock with a heel flap and gusset for the heel to shape the heel. And in my last podcast episode, I said that I was noticing there was a lot of gaps and holes at um, this pickup edge here along the heel flap. And then where you shape the bottom of the heel, hopefully you can see that here, where you shape the bottom of the heel with short rows and decreases, I was noticing there were a few gaps. So then what I did was I, I would just pick up randomly, like pick up some bars here and then knit it together with uh, those decreases to kind of eliminate the holes here and along the, the side here. Um, but once I tried on that first sock, uh, basically I, as I was almost about to reach the decreases, I was like, you know what, let me try on the sock to see how it's fitting. And I, it was very uncomfortable. I really didn't like how the sock was fitting, especially where you work the short row decreases here for the heel. Um, I was I felt the all the bumps in the decreases here because I had picked up some additional stitches and knit them together. Um, so then I got a little bit annoyed at myself because I thought I was so clever by uh, eliminating the holes, but actually it just made the sock really uncomfortable. So I ripped back and then I just followed the instructions um, of, of what Petite Knit says, which I probably should have done in the first place. There is a reason why it was written that way. And actually for that second time where I worked it, I don't really have the same hole. So maybe it, it was just a matter of practice where I, I just needed to do it a few times in order to eliminate those holes. But I did that and now the sock is a lot more comfortable at the heel. Um, so that was a bit silly of me. <laughs> but now uh, I did that for the second uh, sock and now we're on to almost the end of both of these socks. Um, as you can see here, I'm knitting the socks with two different methods. This one I'm using DPNs and then this one I'm using small circulars. I know it's usually not advisable to change your uh, methods halfway through a project because it can impact your gauge, um, but I really want to start getting more practice knitting with small circulars because every time I use them, they tend to make my hands cramp. So um, I'm just trying to get a sense of if it's just my hands and I just shouldn't use this method or if I just need to practice more. Uh, and I figured knitting on four millimeter small circulars, it would be a little bit easier to get a groove of, get into the groove of things rather than like a two millimeter or 2.5 millimeter needle. So um, after I finished working the gusset decreases here, then I started, uh, then I switched to the small circular and then knit this portion of the foot. And I'm gonna do the same thing uh, with this sock here. So if my gauge does change, it'll, it'll still feel the same on both socks. So at least I get some practice with small circulars. So really enjoying, um, these socks so far, and I guess similar to my sweater number 14 v-neck, this is going to be a very warm and cozy type of loungewear knitwear to have and wear uh, around my apartment. My next whip that I have to share is my Sharpay Beanie by Craidia Studio, and I'm holding it up like I finished it, but actually I didn't. <laughs> this is the first version that I knit because I was part of this secret test knit. So this is a beanie pattern that is in the 52 Weeks of Accessories by Lane Magazine. It's their newest publication, uh, which is now officially out. Um, so we can start talking about the, the design. So I test knit this last year and this has become a very well-worn hat in my winter wardrobe. So I wanted to knit that second version. Uh, I'm just holding it up now because I always find it's helpful to see a reference version of what it would look like as a finished object. But what it really looks like now, my second version uh, is like this. <laughs> So this second version here, I was just 
picturing, sorry, I had to pick up some stitches. Uh, I felt while I was in the bag. Um, I was just pic picturing a boucle version of this hat. So the brim of the hat would be boucle here. Uh, and I have some leftover boucle in a off-white cream color. I have it down here from my teddy pillow. So I was just going to use the leftovers here and I think I have enough to knit the brim of, of a hat. So um, for the top part of the hat, the crown, and then the main part of the, I guess, body of the hat, I was calling this the brim by accident in my last podcast. It's not, I'm, I think it's called the body of the hat, um, but I'm using uh, loops and threads, cozy, Wool Merino in the shade Off-White, and then uh, Wendy Air in the shade, um, I think, Cream. So uh, DK Weight Wool Acrylic Blend and a Mohair held together. So the hat is constructed from the top down. I think it's a really interesting construction, and I actually really like top-down hats because I think you can really try it on as you go and see how it's fitting. And also you kind of get the more complicated, more fiddly parts out of the way first. Whereas when you knit a hat from the bottom up, you have to do the decreases at the end, which I kind of end up procrastinating <laughs> because I don't want to be doing something that's a bit more fiddly or it requires more attention. So I like that you kind of get it out of the way first. That being said, I will say that this was quite fiddly and a bit frustrating to work up. So this is um, constructed first with a magic ring cast on. Um, and then after that, you're doing a set of very rapid increases um, to start shaping the crown. And it was extremely fiddly for me because I was using um, double pointed needles. So at the very beginning, you have 10 stitches and I had to distribute 10 stitches on um, three double pointed needles, which I think was why it was very fiddly because there's only a few stitches on each. The pattern recommends magic loop, but I, I prefer double pointed needles. So I kind of just made it more difficult for myself, but we got through it. <laughs> so once you do those increases, then you start shaping the crown of the hat at four different, um, quadrants or, or increasing at four different points. Uh, here and here, here and here. And uh, if you could compare it to like a raglan sweater, I don't know if this could be considered a raglan construction for a hat, but like a raglan sweater, it would be a three stitch raglan, which I really enjoy. Um, I think it looks really clean and neat and there's no um, holes at the sides here. So you uh, work a series of increases until you shape um, the circumference of the hat and until it's big enough and then like I am at right now in this hat, then you just start working in the round for the main part of the hat. Um, I left my stitch markers here just to show you the four increases, but really once you start working in the round, I should probably just take those out. Um, but yeah, right now I'm just really enjoying this project as a more portable project to bring out and about. Um, the pattern is knit on four millimeter needles. I'm knitting on 3.5 millimeter needles just because I've worked with the loops and threads um, cozy wool merino enough to know that it grows quite a bit with blocking. Um, so I decided to size down half a needle size because I knew that once I block this it's going to get a lot um, or maybe not a lot bigger but it's it's definitely going to grow and if I knit it with the four millimeter needles and my gauge I I knew the hat was just going to end up being too big. So um, I am knitting with a 3.5, but as you can see, the gauge is extremely dense. Like, let me try and show you, like, if you, like, poke the hat in, like, it just stays there. <laughs> it is a really stiff fabric, but I am trusting my gut from experience knitting with this specific yarn because it is a blend of superwash merino wool that I just need to trust the process and the hat's going to turn out, but it is a very stiff fabric. I can't stop poking it, but it's a very stiff fabric and that's not something I really want for this hat. So I know that with blocking, it's going to soften up and get a little bit larger. Um, so yeah, just working on the round now. And then um, based off of how I use this boucle, it doesn't really grow at all. Really, it's a pretty stiff 
yarn. So I think I'll size up when I start knitting the brim to four millimeter needles, just because I know that this isn't going to grow that much compared to the other yarn. Uh, but yes, really enjoying this project and hopefully I will finish it soon before it gets a little bit too warm to wear a hat. Okay, so my last whip that I have to share today is one that I haven't shared at all yet. Uh, it's a new cast on and I went through a little bit of a roller coaster. A roller coaster is a bit of a over exaggeration, but I was experimenting with a few different patterns and swatches before I landed on this one. So this is um, the the metal needles are a lot heavier than the finished fabric, which is one strand of mohair. So I'll hold it like this. Doesn't look like very much right now, but this is the blouse number one uh, light by my favorite things knitwear. So um, as I mentioned, this is a finished fabric uh, that's constructed with one strand of mohair on six millimeter needles. Uh, the yarn that I'm using is Knit Picks Aloft in the shade Koi, which is a very bright electric orange, almost like a orangey red. I really like it. Um, but yes, I'm using this yarn here and my initial vision for this top, and I think I've shared it before in my uh, winter knitting plans video. I had plans for this yarn to knit a Aura Top by Rose Knitwear. The Aura Top is a gorgeous um, long sleeved knitted top that's knit with one strand of mohair on a very open and airy gauge and I absolutely love that design. I had intentions for a long time to knit that top just because I absolutely love how it looks. I think it's so like modern but also elegant at the same time. I just really liked how that top looked. The only thing is that top is knit from the bottom up and also the so the body is knit from the bottom up and the sleeves are knit flat and then seamed and those are just two things that I really didn't want to do. Um, I am only I only have a uh, a little bit more than two balls of this Knit Picks Aloft. I have a little bit of leftovers from another project of the Aloft and then that's when I purchased the two additional balls here so I could knit the Aura top. Um, but I don't have a lot of yarn. I have under 500 meters. And so knitting something from the bottom up just really scares me <laughs> when I'm playing a possible game of yarn chicken because with top down you knit kind of like the most important parts which is the shaping of the neckline and the shoulders and then you just knit until you you run out of yarn at, and it just uh, impacts how long the the top is and I also didn't want something seamed um I just really don't like seaming, <laughs> especially the using just one strand of mohair. I didn't trust myself to be able to make it look as neat as it could be like in the pattern uh, or in the product photos. So I just thought, you know what? I am not going to knit it, which is a little bit unfortunate uh, because I have the pattern. My boyfriend got me the Aura Top as a, one of the patterns he got me for Christmas. So I do have it in my pattern library. I just don't think it was meant to be for this yarn because I don't have enough. So I started looking at some alternatives. I also have the Bluffs number one pattern, which is another pattern that my boyfriend got me. He got me quite a few patterns for Christmas. Um, so I have that one in my pattern library and I thought, oh, maybe I can use this pattern um, and kind of modify it. It uses two strands of fingering weight uh, silk, I believe, or you can use, uh, I think, cotton merino. Um, but it's two strands of fingering weight yarn held together, knit on five millimeter needles. So I thought maybe I can knit this um, and a little bit off gauge, like I'll use six millimeter needles and uh, knit a different size. So I tried doing that because I, like I said, I already had the pattern. So I thought, you know what, let me just try it out. Um, so I, had cast that on and then was trying to do an off gauge version but when I thought it wasn't going to work out and then I tried to frog back the mohair that was a absolutely horrible experience <laughs> uh again I'm being very over dramatic but that was really hard to frog back way more difficult than frogging back two strands of mohair held together 
uh, or two, like a strand of fingering and uh, mohair held together. Th those are pretty simple to frog back. This was basically impossible. I ended up having to give up and just cutting the yarn. And like I said, I'm already dealing with a very finite amount of mohair. So I really didn't want to do that, but I had to because it got so tangled when I was trying to frog it back. So after that happened, I was like, you know what? Uh, let me just buy the blouse number one light version, um, which I really didn't want to do because I already have the blouse number one, but they are knit on different gauges. So the blouse number one light is knit with six millimeter needles versus the five millimeter needles of the uh, first blouse number one. And the gauge is also different because you're knitting it with um, six millimeter needles and it was more like the Aura Top. So I thought, you know what? It's it's worth it. So I did end up getting the blouse number one light pattern and I cast on and I'm knitting a size medium. So hopefully after that tangent, <laughs> you're still following along, but basically my thought process was Aura Top, can't do the Aura Top, blouse number one, can't do that. Now I'm on blouse number one light. And I think I landed on the perfect combination so um, the blouse number one is knit with two strands of mohair and I just subbed that out and I'm just doing one strand. So it's a very open and airy gauge. And this is knit from the top down. So I'm really happy so far with the blouse number one light construction. Okay, I can see the rays of sun are starting to come in. So hopefully uh, the lighting is still okay, but I'll try and wrap up this podcast ASAP. Um, but the blouse number one light construction is a contiguous set in sleeve construction. Um, a little bit different than the cognac sweater, but the same gist where you're starting to do increases for the body of the blouse at the same time as working the sleeves as well. So you get a sleeve cap. Uh, but this one is constructed in a very interesting way. You cast on stitches at the top edge here quite tightly and it specifies in the patterns you cast them on quite tightly and then you're working short rows to shape um, the, the neckline so the back of the blouse sits up higher than the front and then you are knitting kind of like a mini saddle shoulder I'll show one right here so you start working increases um, on either side of two stitches there to start shaping the body of the blouse and then you start working uh, after that short set then you start working um, the sleeve cap here. So, so far I'm really liking the construction. It's something interesting, it's something new. Um, and I'm a lot more comfortable knitting in this way because I'll get the um, shoulder and neckline construction done first and then I can just knit the sleeves and body to whatever length and use up as much yarn as I can. In terms of the sizing, I'm also trying to model it off of the Aura Top. Um, but the Aura Top has more positive ease that's built into the pattern, whereas blouse number one light has negative ease. It's intended to have two to five centimeters of negative ease, but I wanted something that was a bit more like open and, and flowy. So I'm knitting a size medium, which has a finished bust of 89 centimeters. Um, so a little bit more positive ease, about um, five centimeters of positive ease for me. I'm really liking how it's knitting up so far. The only thing is, um, I think it's because I ha I'm working with one strand of mohair, but the increases that I've been doing to shape the, um, the shoulder up here, and then as well as the um, sleeve cap, the increases are kind of looking a little messy. I don't know if you'll be able to tell, but it almost looks like at the sides here, I've tried to fix it. A little bit but it kind of looks like I've been doing increases with yarn overs there's like some bars here if you can tell um, but I can see it in person or it's maybe one of those things where you can see it in your work but maybe other people don't notice it at all I just don't really like how messy it looks here and when I was looking at other versions of the blouse on Instagram um, I definitely didn't see that when people had used two strands of mohair together so I think it's just because um, the mohair core like the silk is so thin so you can really kind of see like any type of stitch imperfection and because it's knit at a larger gauge it's just more obvious so that's the only thing where i don't really like the design it's not stopping me from like completely frogging it back i don't hate it that much but i just don't really like this so i wanted to mention that today because if anyone has any suggestions for how to um 
make this look a little bit neater like clean this up a little bit i'm all ears <laughs> i'm thinking maybe when i finish the work i might like graph this together a little bit with some any extra mohair that i have uh also wouldn't oppose to like frogging it back and redoing it maybe if i haven't done enough progress yet <laughs> and there's a way to make it look a lot neater but other than that just like a minor thing um, that i've noticed so far with working one strand of mohair Okay, and that's all of my whips. And now I'm gonna combine my plans and acquisitions together because I did purchase a plate of Plotolopi yarn from the Knitting Loft for an upcoming knitting plan, a spring cast on. Uh, but I have the other yarns here, so I'll just show you. Um, I really wanted to pick up the Plotolopi before this podcast because I wanted to show it in person, but um, unfortunately, with my work schedule, it doesn't really work out to pick up um, the to do any pickups from the knitting loft during the week. So I'm gonna get it tomorrow, but I'll put a little picture here to show uh, the yarn color that I went with as I share the plants. So um, did, I don't know if I mentioned, but I'm planning to cast on the My Honey Vest by Wool and Beyond. This was a pattern that was also similar to my Aura Top or not my aura top, but my modified blouse number one light. Um, that This is a pattern that I featured in my winter knitting plans. Uh, and I'm just getting around to casting it on now, but I'm really excited for it. So in my winter knitting plans, I had shared that I wanted to use this yarn here, um, the Slizzler Git Sock Yarn. Uh, in, and this is in the shade Mary Poppins. Um, my boyfriend got me this yarn when he went to Denmark last summer and so I it kind of all started off with this yarn here and then in my um, winter knitting plans I had the idea to maybe use um, Letlopi as the um, honeycomb brioche on top but um, I, I thought it could work I mean, it's kind of silly, I guess, thinking that it could work because they're completely different gauges. But I just thought because it's the same composition, this wool and the platelope, I thought, you know what, maybe I can make this work for the two gohm honey brioche. But really, it's not going to work because it's a thicker gauge than the platelope. And so um, it's going to mess up the gauge of the two color honeycomb brioche. And also with it being so thick, you probably wouldn't be able to see the background color underneath. And with this yarn, I obviously really want it to shine. It's so gorgeous. So um, I realized that this isn't going to, to work. And then I started looking at the Plotolopi. I ended up going with 1038 ivory beige. I'll insert maybe a picture here. Um, so I was looking at that yarn, but I was also looking at uh, the Plotolopi in the cream off-white shade. And I could see hints of both in this yarn, and I kind of wanted it to correspond with this. Um, I'm going for a more like monochrome version, or not really monochrome, but like less of a contrast. Um, if you see this sample photo of the My Honey Vest, the underneath, um, the color underneath the honeycomb brioche is a very dark purple and red. And she uses, I think she uses actually ivory beige for the top part of the honeycomb brioche. And I wanted something that had less contrast. I think you'll still be able to see this color underneath. There's speckles of like dark gray you can see and spots of a little bit of a more ballerina uh, lighter pink. So I think you'll still be able to see this color underneath, but yeah, I wanted something maybe a little bit more subtle. So that's why I couldn't decide on the Plutzlopi because I wasn't sure which shade they're, they're very similar shades as it, you can see with the two photos I'm going to put on the screen, but I thought that it could actually make a difference with which one would make this color shine or pop underneath. So I ended up going with the ivory beige. That um, was one that was voted on my stories as the most popular one. I think it was like a 75-25, so most people thought the ivory beige. So I thought, I'll listen to everybody um, and I will get that shade. So um, I'm going to use that uh, and this color together. And then for the um, uh, contrast color for the ties, as well as the edging along the vest and then the horizontal back panel, you use a third strand of fingering weight wool. And I was looking in my stash because I really wanted to use something from stash instead of having to purchase a second ball of yarn because 
um, I am on a, a low buy year. So I settled upon the Rosarios 4 Doro yarn. And this is a yarn that I got, uh, I guess over a year now, um, when I was in Portugal in, in Lisbon, I visited the Retrosario, Retrosaria Pomar store in Lisbon. And I got this yarn here. I got, um, uh, five skeins or either six skeins of, of this yarn. I think it was five skeins of this yarn. And so I have over 1400 meters. I intended to get quite a few of this yarn so I can knit like a textured or cabled project. So I kind of felt bad. I was on the fence about deciding to use this. I may change my mind, um, we'll see. But I didn't really want to separate this from the sweater quantity. And that that's something that I brought up in my stash video where I kind of feel bad breaking up sweater quantities if it doesn't suit the project. But I just think it really um, is going to pair well with the ivory beige and then also tie into this too. And I, I just thought it was really perfect. And even without this, um, ball of yarn, I still am going to have around 1200 meters of, of this wool. Um, I have a few other hanks, I think um, four other hanks of this yarn. So I'll still be able to uh, make it work for a sweater. So hopefully I don't come to regret that, but um, I really wanted to use something that I had in stash already. So once I pick up the Pleptolope from the Knitting Loft, I know I'm going to cast this on right away because I'm just really inspired by all of these colors. I, I'm really happy with this combination. And also I know the two color honeycomb brioche is going to take me quite a bit of time. And I really want to wear this vest to Knit City. You know how people have like a Rhinebeck sweater? Um, I really want to have a Knit City sweater, or in this case, a Knit City vest that I'm going to wear. I know I have so many other sweaters that I can wear, but I don't know. I just thought that this would be perfect because it's in May, so this could be a nice springtime transitional piece to wear, uh, where you can still wear a vest indoors without getting hot. So that's why I really want to finish this by May, which is when Knit City is. But I am quite intimidated by Honeycomb Brioche. I have worked it one time before. Um, I'll, I'll get the project to share. So I knit Honeycomb Brioche before when I knit the Honey Bucket Bag by Petite Knit. So this was a project that I knit in the spring of 2022. So coming up to two years ago now, and I haven't knit brioche since then, because <laughs> I had a really tough time with this bag. This is just knit with a one color honeycomb brioche, and I used Art Fill yarn, um, I think their sock yarn in the shade Rhubarb, and Drops Kid Silk in the shade, I think Raspberry maybe. Uh, it's a gorgeous combination together, and I love how it looks in this bucket bag, but the two color honeycomb brioche was a uh, extreme struggle for me because I still don't really know how to frog back or fix your mistakes in brioche. I tried to follow videos and try and fix it, but I just couldn't wrap my head around how to fix your mistakes in brioche. So essentially every time I made a mistake, I would just have to frog back. Um, and I learned eventually while knitting this bag to insert lifelines every like few centimeters as I went. So when I did have to frog back, I wouldn't have to frog back to the very beginning. Um, but uh, it was a really slow process. This bag is knit on 2.5 millimeter needles, um, I believe, either 2.5 or 3 millimeter needles. I'm sorry, it's forgetting me because it's two years ago, but. Um, it really tested my patience and I was so sick of honeycomb brioche after that that I didn't want to touch it ever again until I saw this honey, my honey vest. So I'm going to persevere. I learned a lot of lessons from knitting this bucket bag. So hopefully um, I this time around I'll have an easier time with it and I'm starting it now so I have quite a bit of time to knit it before Knit City. So um, I do have an acquisition, I guess this podcast, but I don't have it to share physically, but that's what it's going to become. And I'm really excited for this plan. So that was everything for podcast episode number seven. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much if you've reached this point of the episode. And um, I am having a lot of fun with all of these kind of more warm weather. I mean, I guess besides the still a bit of a mix, like I have my hat and then my socks as well. Um, but more spring cast-ons with the My Honey Vest and the Blouse Number 1 Light. 
which reminded me that I should get started on my spring knitting planning and starting to think of some project plans. So that's starting to percolate in my mind and it's a upcoming video that I'm gonna be sharing soon, some spring knitting plans with stash yarn. Really like making those videos and looking at my stash, so that'll be coming soon. Um, and with that, I will say goodbye and see you uh, in my next video.